like any kind of stimulus in life, just getting married, having kids, buying a house, anything you do is good for your comedy. Just kind of throws you out of your thing. That's one thing. That's why I'm not like, I'm an old man. I like every day the same way. And that's not good for comedy. You want to get knocked out of your comfort zone. This is Festival Past Stories, a podcast series is told by the people who create and make festivals come to life. You will go behind the stage, kitchen, or studio door to hear the stories of passion and inspiration that started some of the world's most beloved festivals. Hear the startup stories and how an idea went from what if to what's next. All right, friends, this is the Festival Pass Stories podcast. We are produced by Jonah Wright and Challenger Road Media and presented by Dos Hombres, the artisanal mezcal meant to be shared. Created by Aaron Paul and Brian Cranston. Have a drink with us at dosombres.com slash delivery. Hey, ever wanted to have the opportunity to invest in a product early? That could be the next Airbnb. My guest is like, hmm, tell me, tell me more, tell me more. Well, learn why entrepreneurs and celebrities with exits approaching one plus nine, so $10 billion, have already invested in Festival Pass. Go to invest.festivalpass.com to learn more. Now, friends, we've had some funny festival friends on the show. My next guest is by far the funniest guest we've ever had from Syracuse, New York, because I believe he is the first guest we've had from Syracuse, New York. So uh, by default, he wins that title. And without further ado, unless he wants some more ado, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the great Moody, Patrick McCarthy. Moody. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Pat. Good to be with you. Hey, you did <laughs> yeah. your homework there. My, my middle name is Patrick. It, yeah, you know, it was a layup yeah. for me. I was going to guess it was anyway. I was like, is it Aiden? <laughs> is it Patrick? What's it? Aiden, if you were born in like, you know, in like the last 15 years, I would have guessed Aiden. Um, right. But right. Um, I, I, I'm also guessing I am now the first person since your mother to call you by your full name. Is that true? Yeah, it doesn't happen much. And so my real name is Matthew Patrick McCarthy. And my wife, oh. who's an only child, a Jewish only child, and I'm one of seven, big Irish group. She thinks it's hysterical that my older brother is Patrick Matthew. And it never occurred to me. She just thinks that's funny that we were just running out of names so early. I, <laughs> I, I, I thought that was normal, but but who knows? Yeah. How many saints are there in the Bible? How many saints? <laughs> We've got seven kids. I mean, well, are, we, are we out at this point? We might be out. Jeez. <laughs> just switch the names back and forth. They now, I am from Syracuse, kids. but I'm not yeah. the, funniest, the funniest guy from Syracuse. Be Bobcat Goldthwait. Oh, <laughs> good Syracuse boy. And his best friend from kindergarten is a guy named Tom Kenny, who is uh, like a brilliant voiceover guy and, and a stand up comic as well. But he's a voice of SpongeBob and Cat Dog and a whole bunch of movies. So th those two guys wow. were kindergarten buddies. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not just DJ Ronnie Cycli. It's, uh, it's more, <laughs> there's so many, there's so many famous people. Uh, Richard Gear. Richard Gear. Yeah. Richard yeah. Gear is a Syracuse guy. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. And then we we tried to count them, but Tom Cruise was his first three years or something were there. And then There's he named his daughter people. Sierra. So his daughter is uh, Sierra Cruise, which people in Syracuse want credit for. Like it's almost Syracuse. Yeah, it's almost, Syracuse. He's like, Sierra Cruise. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of from there. I'm kind yeah, of yeah, from yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a yeah, lot of people yeah. that take credit for Tom Cruise. New Jersey, like it's yes. New, everybody is trying to get a little piece of Tom Cruise. Um, exactly right. Until he starts talking religion and politics, and people are like, "Look, I, I'm pretty sure he's from Florida. I, I'm not exactly uh, exactly sure where he's from. After all, we're, we're no no one's historians have lost it along along the way. Yes. Um, yes. But now, now that we are on the subject of your name, which is which is fascinating, we could do this all day. Uh, but we've heard your name without the Patrick, of course, on shows like Letterman, Jimmy Kimmel, Last Comic Standing, Star Search. And uh, I just want to put this disclaimer out there for the kids listening. Now, Star Search was American Idol before American Idol, and Letterman was the guy who had the late show before Colbert. Now he just has a long beard and occasionally interviews a Kardashian. Okay, I think we're all caught up with that. But on the story there about your name, how you became Moody. From, so Matthew to Moody, and uh, it, it, your Jewish wife gave you the nickname? Is that how it came about? Or oh, was no, it no, no, no. It was like, this no, guy no, no. is Moody as hell. <laughs> That's his name. No, she was late to the game. No, I got the nickname when I was one years old. So my older brothers, 
<laughs> didn't even know what the word they they were only five they didn't even know what the word like meant smart kids. they're, they're, smart they're kids. twins yeah yeah so it was just a nonsensical no just they started calling me moody and then my parents call me that's what my parents still call me that the whole the neighborhood i grow up i have some friends who don't know my real name and it um i'm so used to it ever like every three years it occurs to me i go hey i'm walking around with a goofy goofy name but um <laughs> You know, once in a while, depending if I'm – like once in a while, it's just easier to say Matthew. Or if it's like um, an official – even if I'm getting a, uh, a new phone or what in some business transaction, my ID is Matthew, you know. But once in a while, I'll be, I'll be playing pickup basketball or something like that. And uh, instead of going, yeah, Moody and a nickname, what I'll go, yeah, I'm, uh, what's your name? I'm Matthew, right? And then like two minutes later, they're calling for Matthew, and I forget that I'm Matthew. I, You know, so I'm not even – so it, 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 it's the brain. Fog. I had a call on the brain fog now from the COVID. Ex exactly. We're both, we both had our breakthrough. Me, me and Pat are breakthrough. Yeah. The breakthroughs yeah. we were hoping for were vaccinated ah, and, and had, yeah. With all yeah. the breakthroughs yeah. the last couple of years, that was the one that we, you know, we were yeah. very excited. They got to come up with a new name uh, instead of breakthrough. Uh, I, I don't know what, what to call it, but just, just infection or something, but it's like, sure. You, you can't call these breakthroughs anymore because this Delta thing, has just completely taken over and uh you know you got to go get the booster and i i'm i'm one of the lucky uh, people who got the johnson and johnson so what's going to happen next that every day i wake up and it's like breaking news and i'm like will will we die i look at my wife i'm like i think we have 72 hours left we should probably get stuff in order. <laughs> pat i did a show for johnson and johnson yesterday morning that was my i did a virtual show at 8 a.m for their globe, it wasn't the scientists or anyone like that. And I didn't, I didn't want to tease them about being, uh, you know, the the least effective of the, of the three approved here. And I, I, you know, I hadn't been paid yet, so I, I, I was. But I did a show for Pfizer last summer, a virtual show uh, during the height of the thing. Yeah, they they were they were a good they were a good crowd. I did, that was Pfizer's like uh, senior global team, and. Uh, I go, hey, um, I'm following the news a little bit. Seems like pharmaceuticals are, it's a slow time for you guys, right? Not a lot going on. And, and <laughs> but uh, they were good. I, I told them, I go, uh, I go, I have a feeling like the people at Oxford aren't watching a stand up comic like this morning. And, and if they were, it would be a name one, like, like Ricky Gervais or anything. But they were, they were good, uh, good natured bunch. So, yeah, I entertained Pfizer and Johnson and Johnson. So for a couple, like for like a total of about forty minutes, I've been an essential worker. The rest of yes, the time, I'm, I'm non-essential. I mean, yeah, I meant to say that at the start of the podcast before we mentioned the sponsor. Uh, you know, the, the ombres there together. That could have been your brother. Your twin brothers could have been the, the dose ombres as well. I think. <laughs> yeah. They, uh, <laughs> they could have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They yeah. they worked they, yeah. they worked their brands together to come up with uh, with Moody. I think that was impressive at, at a young age. So. Oh, for five year olds, yeah, they're way ahead of the game. It has yeah. come. You know, it's funny. I I do know two other Matthew McCarthy's doing stand up comedy. So it's good to have a little nickname just in terms of. Uh, you know, getting the uh, getting the Gmail address and all that stuff. Yeah, you know? and when you're on the road, you can either be Matthew at the hotel, you could be Moody. You know, when you're right, when you're calling for a pizza right. or something like that. You know, you you could be yeah. You can use your just you can be discreet. It's it's, it's amazing. It is a good dichotomy because if the phone rings for Matthew, I know it's not a buddy. I know it's uh, <laughs> probably spam. Speaking. Speaking. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. So let's talk about stand up. Let's talk about the heart of stand-up joke writing and the late and excuse me if uh, you're not a fan but the late great norm mcdonald was a oh. judge on one of the shows you were on last yeah. comic standing and i loved watching that show just because how critical he was like the simon cowell when it came to joke writing but yeah you could tell you could tell it came from the heart because he's like no no yeah. no it's all about the precision of the joke and joke writing yeah. is tough, but how tough was he on the contestants? From he was tough, and I wasn't. I didn't. The season I did, he was not one of the judges. He came in later, and he was um, so watchable. He was one of my favorite guys. And I, but I remember a couple of things he said. I remember someone came out, and they were they were like a very uh, um, physical, and I didn't think he was going to go for that. And he said, uh, he gives, he said. When he got into comedy, he thought it was all about uh, uh, being a wordsmith and this and that. But he says the older he gets, like some of the funniest people, he, he's, he said like 
some stand-up like even like you know from 20 years ago or even like George Carlin doesn't hold up today but the old physical stuff still makes yeah. him laugh oh sure so I so that was something that I never would have thought of and 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 I think he's right about that like some of the old uh, just even WC fields there well, well, those Harold Lloyd and all those it's crazy to watch it's still crazy to watch um, yeah I just I got I to just, work with Norm one time yeah Oh, you did? I did a weekend with him, yeah, in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, uh, there's a good club there. And this is probably 15 years ago, and he did. You do four shows: two Friday, two Saturday, and uh, he kind of did different material every time. He would just go up and and he 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 didn't like you know he didn't murder the whole time, but he's I watched every second of it. and He was great, and he closed yeah. one show with a with a joke. He liked street jokes too, you know. He throw in yeah. street jokes, which is kind of a no no. But a couple of guys, I think, if you're tenured enough, if you're so established. You know, like a guy like Gilbert Gottfried, he just tells street jokes now, and it's still hysterical. But yeah. I've always loved street jokes. Most comics don't. But uh, yeah, it was. I didn't get to interact with Norm too much, but uh, but he was a sweet dude. Yeah, and the, he's, the physical comedy is good. I just uh, finished watching um, Only Murders in the Building, so put it on mute if anybody doesn't want a spoiler. This isn't even a spoiler, oh, but there's some. Okay. Steve Martin does some physical comedy that is hilarious you know he's like okay you know, it's just like it's part of the plot so i don't want to ruin it for anybody out there but the, you know and i'm sitting there cracking up my wife is like it's not that funny i'm like i don't know it just reminds me of old wild and crazy guy kind of stuff i don't know yeah but uh yeah it was just, it was just great to see and and how he can you know master that kind of stuff and just make it look so real uh and, and play it up uh but did that show actually you know there were other critical uh, people about about the jokes, about the writing of the jokes. Do you do you think that kind of experience made you a better joke writer? You know, those shows like um, where you're doing a short set are um, yeah, they do make you more efficient. Yeah, they do. They definitely do. Like I remember because um, you, you start um, to learn to write for TV, like those short, quick answers. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and you watch your. It's kind of a funny exercise, like. Um, those shows, like uh, I was lucky enough to, to do Letterman twice, which was my career goal, just do Letterman twice. And you send them, these shows are like, all right, send us a tape and write out a transcription too, like every, which comics would never do on their own, watch a five minute tape of themselves and type every word. And as you're typing these words, you're like, why did I say that? I didn't have to say that. Like, I already, like in a club setting or, or whatever, you end up saying a lot of little asides or trying to be conversational and uh, you realize the joke doesn't need it. And you don't see that until you're forced to type it out. And then when you, if you do one of those sets on the air, you can't throw off like, you know, hey, you know what I'm talking about, you know, all these little asides. So yeah. it does make you more efficient. Yeah, it, it's kind of a balance between being real efficient with your joke and being a little conversation if you're in a live setting being a little conversational but um sometimes i'm in like you know so i live in new york city like you and sometimes the clubs um sometimes i'm like i go i'm being too jokey too like one linery and they kind of don't want that in new york city they want they want you to uh to mix it up with them a little bit so i'm not a like a pure new york comic yeah yeah they do yeah you're yeah. more of an uh, i would say you're more of an upstate new york comic if that's uh if i could say i that. am i am that's true yeah which kind of um kind of midway when i moved to new york city i've been here like 20 years a little more uh like people thought i might be canadian i've probably <laughs> lost we have that upstate new york accent which is um uh how are you how are you <laughs> and i was like hey how are you but definitely not new york so i think when i go somewhere and um they say i'm from new york i think people are a little disappointed i'm not like for, you know I say hey you know i'm not a brave how you doing i'm not one of these you know I think they're a little disappointed. I'm not more of a New York character. You don't walk. I'm a little stage. disappointed. You know, you're like, look at me. I'm walking here, right under the stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I actually heard somebody say that yesterday. I'm not kidding. I'm not. Oh, kidding. I'm There's, walking here. Yeah. There's construction <laughs> going on on my block, so I live on that block in New York where the construction's going on. So every block, pick a. I just. I, people are like, oh, now we're gonna find them. No, you won't. You won't. There's every other block. There's something going on. But they're doing some yeah. sewer work or whatever they're doing. So there's like only one lane that you can get through. And the car is like going around. And this guy goes, Ow! I'm walking here. And I think he almost <laughs> realized it himself. 
<laughs> where he was like, did I just pull a John Voight right there? And, uh... <laughs> I saw a real New York moment uh, a couple of years ago in a pizza shop, but Two Boots Pizza, which is got, is, I, I uh, love the pizza. It's very spicy. Guy comes in, he goes, uh, he's looking at the slices. He got all the thing. He goes, uh, did he got a bathroom? And the, the guy goes, no. You know. He goes, all right, I'll, I'll take a plain slice then. <laughs> like, like <laughs> if, they, if they had a bathroom. He was yeah. going to go more adventurous, you know. Yeah, he didn't have a bathroom. He's like, yeah, I'll take, uh, yeah. I'll take a Mister Pink. Uh, I'll, I'll take a Siciliano, and uh, <laughs> you know, a twenty dollars gift certificate too. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it's funny. I don't even know if that's legal to sell food and not provide a restroom. I, I don't know. I don't even know if that's legal. You know. Yeah, there's something that there's some law in New York where, um, and I think this is actually just the law or, or the rule. Uh, is that you don't have to buy something to use a place's restroom. But if oh, I own okay. the joint, if, if yes. I own the pizza joint and some guy comes on off yeah. the street and he's like, oh, God, oh, I just I just had uh, I just had Indian food. Can I use your bathroom? And I'm like, hold on one second here, pal. Uh, I don't think so. Um, you know, but I mean, you should have the discretion to yeah. to be able to let someone use your restroom or not. Right. I've done that. So I have young, I'm an old dad. I have young kids and we, we've been in that situation, stuck in traffic. One of the kids got to go to the bathroom and me and my wife, okay, bring him into a bar. Go, Can we use your bathroom? And uh, I go, I'll go, I'll get a Coke too. I just, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. uh, we're going to, we're going to use your, we're going to flush your toilet and I could use a bump of caffeine anyway. So win-win. And they're like, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. And you're like, you know what? Uh, two shots of Jameson too while they're in the bathroom. If uh, no one, yeah, can hear hon, you, right you drive home. I'm gonna hit the Guinness. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, well, you guys are in the bathroom. <laughs> I met I met Joe here at the bar, and we we had such a good time. And uh, Joe yeah, is yeah, my yeah. best friend, and I love you, Joe. Yeah. Um, but of course, drink responsibly, <laughs> friends, especially when the kids are in the car. Please, that that yes. message of responsibility was brought to you by our friends, <laughs> Dos Hombres, right there. Um, <laughs> So was there a was there a particular joke or, or or two different jokes maybe that you know that you wrote early on and you said man this stuff this is killer stuff I have got to get on a stage and try this out for your first stand up experience Yeah that's a good question I've I'm never super confident in a joke cuz you don't know if it's going to work till it works but I had a joke and I remember I was very flattered um by what happened. So my hometown of Syracuse is kind of the rust belt. It's the snow belts that, you know, it's a lot of belts. I love it. Belts. It's, yeah, it's a lot of and big belt. Exactly. Right. So I did a joke there when I started, I go, this is the only city in the country that, um, our downtown is safer at night. Cause it's like a ghost town at night. I go during the day, there's more pedestrians in the street. Then on the sidewalk, at night, you could feed the deer. And a guy from the local paper did an article on me. I go, how'd you pick me? He goes, that joke is so true that I knew it wasn't a joke you were telling in every city. Like, whoever told that joke was, was from here. Like, I remembered, yeah. like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then uh, the joke that I have that does best for me, I remember thinking of it going, eh, it's kind of funny, but uh, you never know. But it's probably the, the only joke that I'm like, no matter what's going on, I think this joke is going to work. And it was kind of inspired by uh, the actress uh, Kathleen Turner. Is that her name? She's got a husky yeah. voice. Yeah. yeah. She's in Body Heat. Yes. But I was like, um, I was like, um, the joke is um, men love a woman with a raspy voice. You know, when we hear a woman with a raspy voice, we think, hey, maybe she's all done yelling. You know? <laughs> and I remember thinking that was kind of funny, but that, that, that's the only joke in my act is like, all right, that that's probably gonna work. If that joke doesn't that work, is, I'm in real trouble. Well, that's one of them. Just that's a, what I'm saying. Like you wrote a joke like that, and you're like, "Get me on a stage because I can build off but, of that right there." Yeah, I thought that'll get a laugh. I didn't think it would. I, when I wrote that, I didn't think that would be have the highest batting average of my jokes. <laughs> then I have one joke. My wife is Jewish, and I have a joke that <laughs> the Jewish people really like. And I think I did a tour of Israel two years ago. Porsche belt before the belts. <laughs> yeah. And they just they just like the logic of this joke. And if there's no Jewish people in the room, it might get a chuckle. But the joke is that um, people ask me if my wife is real religious. And I go, no, she, she married me. I go, in fact, I'm a better Jew than her because I married a Jew. 
And just Jewish people just like the logic of that joke. And that joke got me like a, a tour of Israel. Like, I think that's just one liner. So once in a while, one liner can really connect. But even still, a good joke is a little uh, kind of parochial. It might work somewhere here, might work here. I have a couple of jokes. I have jokes on daylight savings time. <laughs> and when the weekend of daylight savings time, I'm like, all right, this joke is going to get, this joke's going to get an eight. And then the rest of the year, depending on how far I am from daylight savings time, it's, uh, you know, it'll sink to a two or a three. I have jokes about the Olympics. If the Olympics are going on, all right, all right, this is jokes. This is going to be a seven. This is going to be a nine. And then uh, off years, like, it's like, why is he talking about the Olympics? Joke's going to be a two or three. Yeah, during the uh, hybrid events, the, the joke I've been using is, uh, you know, like, hey, and, the, and for the millions watching from home. But I, I can also say, yeah, it doesn't matter how many are watching from home. We all know that it's going to be better ratings than the Summer Olympics. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Because there yeah. you see. There. yeah. Yeah, and it's funny. I have we we have these virtual jokes, and then I go do a live show. I'm like, no, oh, they they're not gonna. I I can't do the virtual. Jo-. I had to like readjust to doing live shows again. Uh, what was that actual? Because I'm sure you remember the actual first time that you got the guts to get up there on stage. Oh what yeah, was that yeah. like? Yeah, I, I was like, um, I was 25 years old. I was like, kind of a. a I played guitar in a cover band. So music could be my first love. And then I kind of didn't go anywhere with that. So I'm 25 years old. I was like, yeah, I want to do co- I had always liked comedy. I'm old enough to remember Johnny Carson. And if a comic came out, that was my favorite thing. Just like, I can't believe this one person is just uh, carrying, just doing the whole thing. And um, so I'd write down little premises. And it took me like a year to get up to the nerve. I, I, find, I literally had jaw pain. Like my face was starting to hurt just knowing that I had to try stand up comedy. And the first time I did it, I had a couple buddies with me. I had a couple beers in me. It was a bringer show. Was it a bringer show? It was not. This is bringers <laughs> is kind of a, like a New York animal where where some of the clubs like to get on stage, you have to bring the audience with you. Um I did. I'd never heard of bringers till I, I, I moved till yeah. I moved. Oh yeah, yeah. They're they're a, they're their own animal. Um, yeah. So it was problem, an open mic night. You have to bring everybody to the bar afterwards and buy them drinks. Yeah, know? yeah. Like thanks for. It's always to my like five um, minutes. There are people who like they work in an office and it's the first time they do a bringer. Thirty people will come out. You know they'll have yeah. thirty friends. You're like, so it'd be like, hey, is everyone ready for Scott? And half the room just goes crazy. Yeah. Like I think Scott, I think Scott brought some people. And then after Scott, Scott set, you know, they're still buzzing and everything like yeah. that. But then, if Scott two years later, Scott's got a Scott can't find five people anymore. People, yeah, but yeah. the first like two time, shows later, Scott. Scott. Yeah, Scott, Perfect. didn't we do that or didn't we go down that road already, Scott? Yeah, you know, you know, accounting can't be there, but HR would love to come and hear your material. Uh, no, that, <laughs> yeah. that's okay. We, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So my first show HR. was an open mic. It was like an open mic at the club, and then one of the the professionals would close the show, but literally just sign and go up. And I think it was. Um, uh a five minute set and i don't and uh i i yeah it was a blur it went well and a lot of comics have the same story where the first time went well i think they introduced me as a first time and the crowd was nice and i go i i made it man i can do this and then you bomb for like three months straight and i used to try different stuff every week i didn't know even to like try to hone a piece and everything so it took me about three years to go like okay i'm starting to zero in on what can uh what can work on stage and what can't. And then I think that's the, uh, the arc of a comic is your first time on. I needed, personally, I needed some alcohol, a couple, couple of beers, and that stayed with me for a while. And then you don't need alcohol at all. And I'm at the stage now where I need coffee. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm like, like, I'm I, like I better I, get I, nervous, man. Yeah. yeah. You got a 10.30 p.m. show, and you're like, better do some espresso before I get out there. Even though yeah. I won't sleep and then, for two days. There are shows, literally, if people are like, do you get nervous? I'm like, sometimes I'm not nervous enough. Like, I'm too relaxed or I'm preoccupied with a couple of errands I got to do. And I'm like, hey, I better start thinking about horribly wrong. This can go, you know. The, yeah. I better get a little fear in myself. Well, when I do my when I do the auctions, it's like kind of like reinventing myself every time out there. And not that I'm comparing myself to stand up, but there are elements to it where it's, you're live in front of an audience. Yeah. I'm always writing like an icebreaker that's, you know, I'm like, well, what's like a, a good old dad joke or something I could use here that's not going to offend anybody? Uh, no yeah. politics, no religion or anything like that. But I'm always yeah. like working on something and I'm like, oh, that's great. That works. And, you know, I'll test it on a friend. I'll send him a text. I'm like, hey, I'm at this event. I'm about to say this. 
and he and he'll write back to me and say, "Why don't you tweak it with this?" Um, okay, yeah. You know, you know his his uh, his one of the guys I sent it to. His name is Joe Tully. No relation, actually. So we yeah. are not not related at all. Though he's like, we're both from Ireland. One day ago, he's like, I I, I think we actually might be related somewhere along the way. But let's just play this game because it's more fun. Um, but it's like you know, and you're out there and you're selling stuff and you're trying to raise money, and sometimes the crowd is dead. And you have to work yeah. with that. You still have to get through your stuff. I'm like, okay, we've got 15 live auction items tonight. And people are sitting there with their arms folded and their hands in their pocket. You know, the stock market dropped 700 points that day. And people are <laughs> a little, little skittish about uh, throwing yeah. some money to the charity. They're like, we already bought our table. We did our part. Like, don't raise your, you know, we, we lost all that money. Mark Zuckerberg said something offensive. Facebook dropped down today. That's why my entire retirement in that. So it's yeah. like it's it, you know you're there and you just Ever. you're like well but before i go on the stage and i've done this thousands of times as you have done this thousands of times in in, in your craft and people will say that same thing they're like do you get nervous at this point i'm like you know what it's it's like it's anxious energy and i need yeah. to kind of have that that keeps yeah. me sort of on the edge and uh you know I, I think it's like if you lose that if you don't have that fear of failure um, yeah. If you don't have that, like if you're so confident, you're going to get out there and it's just going to come across as not genuine to the crowd. And they're going to be like, you know, this guy's feeling himself or, or whatever. So before yeah. I go out there, I'm always like, you know, uh, you know, I, I might send my wife a text, uh, you know, to wish me luck or something like that, you know, and she's got like an autoresponder on there at this point. She's like, yeah, just you know, go. You know, you know, <laughs> but you know i need that i need that kind yeah. of thing to make sure that it's okay to go out there and do it and then as soon as i start talking you know all that stuff is gone and then it's just yeah. like now you're in the zone now you're doing your thing um so from that standpoint although i'm not out there i'm not paid to make jokes but there's definitely my style is the improv and the comedy and, and that's how i even got into it in the first place by accident I've when somebody didn't show up for an auction Okay. You know, I jumped on stage. It's a skill. It's a real skill. I, I got it. I've been asked. I've had to auction like maybe two or three times. And I'm not, I do not have that. I, I don't know. There's a real skill to it. I think I raised about 40 bucks for some uh, unlimited airfare anywhere in the world for five, for a family go. of eight. Yeah. There you go. Hey, no, it's a real like, skill. And you're, you're right. It's the, the same pot, thing. You got to read a room. You're black, my friend. You know, you know, <laughs> you can go the other way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but every room has its own energy, like you're saying, its own uh, yeah things. And I do stand up. Sometimes I do like I'm at these, so I kind of do private events more often than not. Sometimes I'll be at like some kind of function where I'm like, um, you know, you talk about a dead room. Sometimes I'm like, uh oh, these people are having a phenomenal time, and we're about to make them stop to listen to me. Like sometimes they're having too good a time. Now your your yours is a different. Uh, um, uh, goal. You're raising money. Mine's like I'm just trying to entertain them. I'm like, these, the, the, there's too much buzz in this room. These people are having a great time. They do not right. need me. And then other times it's um, completely dead. And I go, all right, well. But I do these Zoom shows now, and those are a weird animal. But yeah. I've come to realize, like, I joke with them now. I go, look, I go, uh, I go. My wife works remotely. She's in meetings all the time. So I really, I, I just have to be a little more entertaining. Than a meeting, right? And they're like, "Yeah, I go, okay, all right." <laughs> Not a lot of pressure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here we go. And uh, here we go. And when you do those uh, Zoom comedy nights um, or comedy, maybe they're afternoons. I don't know. At this point, you can do them whatever. People don't even know what time yeah. it is. Anymore. You but sure when can. You do these? Yeah. Do you just put everybody on mute automatically, or do you select certain people to be like a laugh track no. in the background? You know, it's funny. The it's it's been the arc of the the pandemic. Early on, we, we like to hear some people. Early on, everyone was unmuted. Like, this Zoom was a new thing. People didn't know. There were a lot of hot mics out there and noisy. And you need to hear people uh, <laughs> with leaf. People had leaf blowers in their living room for some second, yeah. you know, yeah. dogs. And, that. and then, then everyone got very shy. And I've done shows. Pat, I did a show. I've done this twice. A 40-minute set, every single camera and mic off. So I'm just looking. I'm in their basement, just uh, looking at my their names. But the first time it threw me off, and then you just you get jokes for everything if you do it again. I go, hey, I know you guys feel bad for me because I'm not getting any feedback, but uh, 
And I know you guys are watching Ted Lasso. I go, don't feel funny for me. I'm watching a great documentary on meerkats right now. You know, <laughs> so I have these little jokes about everyone's multitasking. And yeah, I have a joke. So this is a virtual backdrop. I tell people, I go, this is not a virtual backdrop. I go during this quarantine. You can rent a theater for 40 bucks. I go, let's do it. Let's go all out. That's the $40 you raised at that charity event. You threw it right into that theater. So That's right. Repurpose That's that right. cash. I was going to say yeah. you live in New York City. I'm like, I'm like, ladies and gentlemen who are watching this podcast, uh, not just listening to it, he is actually living in a theater in New York City. So he's got, it's rent controlled. He's ready to go. Yeah. The theater's open at 1% capacity. So <laughs> it's just me and the spotlight guy. <laughs> well he's union no so i'm in a dismal there. room i'm in a really dismal room um i could show it to you if anyone you wanna, let's see i'm in a i'll I, I show like you this i like the background i like what's going on back there okay yeah yeah no i you know even picking this out took some trial and error because you want a dark perimeter you don't want to be drowned yeah. out and uh and then i joke there's my backup mic right there which uh <laughs> i i keep it hot yeah. So yeah. In case I, this I'm one goes down, we've always got a backup folks. And, and yes, a very good lesson for life is that every mic is a hot mic. Um, I think Ronald Reagan said that uh, after he got caught on one in 1980 uh, <laughs> yeah. or something. Yeah. Let them all eat yeah. cake. You know, I know we're getting a little tight on time here, so I'm going to go through a um, through a little bit of a lightning round of all the great shows that you've been on. So get ready. Here we go. Sure um, we go. That looks like a star search stage back there. Was that your first big break when you were on that show? That was, yeah. And it's funny, once in a while, star, first of all, like no one remembers it, but the people who do remember it, there was it was there was one in the eighties and nineties with Ed McMahon. Yes. They brought it back. They brought it back. <laughs> you had that queued up. You were ready for that. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> they brought it back in two thousand three with uh, Arsenio Hall. So that was my first that was my first network tv and it was live too and hey you know it's funny you learn as you get older the, even the live shows they're only live to half the country to the east coast and central like people in california they don't get anything live even snl they don't get really truly live i don't think no, but um you're right but it was exciting it was very exciting yeah, it was too like exciting Saturday afternoon live for them if they if they started watching it uh live i guess right on the right coast. right yeah right and uh star search um the judge, one of the judges was Magic Johnson. I'm a huge basketball fan. That was kind of cool. But I, I, um, I didn't do well on the show. It was like a minute. You only had to do a minute 40. It was like, boom, boom, boom. And I watched the wow. tape now. I was so amped up. My voice is like an octave higher than natural. And, I, <laughs> and so I just rushed the jokes, and I was frenetic. And, uh, uh, but it's a good, like, you good life. You're watching your voice on. You're like, hey, everybody, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about, <laughs> think about diners? Hey, let me tell you something about diners. Yes, that was it. That was it. And uh, but it was fun. It was a thrill. It was a real thrill just to um, just to get out there and to and to, to do a live show is challenging too. That's an added layer of like, what if I, what if I get Tourette's all of a sudden oh, and yeah. this and that? Yeah, yeah. You know, live TV uh, and like during the when we were doing all these fundraisers and stuff during the uh, we're doing our virtual fundraisers over the last eighteen months. We were trying to explain to the organizations. We're like, uh, like, well, this person's going to be live and this person's going to be live. And we're like, you can pre-record everything. People won't really know the difference, but the more people are connecting from more different locations, the more difficult it's going to be for the production. And it's a lot. You have to think of it as live TV and ask anybody who's ever worked in producing live TV how difficult it is to keep everything on schedule, or like to the yeah. second, to the minute. Yeah. It's really difficult. Yeah, 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 yeah. I remember, one thing I remember about Star Search was like, so it's my first thing is like, it's, I think it was NBC, whatever. And they didn't have a bathroom for us. So I remember like, and, and you don't get any sleep. I've realized every big event in your life, you don't get sleep. You know, it could be your, your uh, wedding or something in your career or something, any milestone. Someone messes with your sleep. So, anyway, so, I didn't, so I'm exhausted. I'm on my feet all day. And they don't have a bathroom for us. So I'm in line with the audience to go to the bathroom. I'm, like, oh, I'm, just, I'm going on live TV in like 30 minutes and here I am waiting in a st stall it's very humbling Excuse me, I'm, so you get I'm to moody. see that. i'm gonna be on soon yeah 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 the guy in front of me tried to say that too no he's also gonna be on no no we're, we're we we gotta pee and then we gotta get on stage please please let me go <laughs> i had that too you're, with you're, uh with you're like i'll buy three slices can i get now can i use the bathroom exactly it was like that but it's just so humbling it's like a real you get to see it's a little bit of a cattle call it's just like yeah you know you're just a moving part in the thing and um 
It was funny with the, the three, three slices, with like, hey, that's what the guy said. I had to get a suit for Letterman, and um, they had a, I had a, like two days' notice, and my and I called again. So finally, they were like, yeah, it might not be. I go, I'm doing, I'm doing, I'm doing network TV tomorrow. I, I, I need this suit. Yeah, sure you are, buddy. Everyone tells us that. I go, no, I really am. <laughs> And then I call the file, like, quit calling here. So I th- meanwhile, I think my wife is calling him, but it was, it was yeah, all that stuff is that, that all happens like that. It's all rushed. Yeah, and, and speaking of, of Letterman, um, you know, you were on there more than once, which is unbelievable. And you said one of your career goals was to be on Letterman twice and you could yeah. retire, but you know, that obviously wasn't the case. And <laughs> Johnny Carson used to give the couch to the great comedians, right? And oh, yeah, yeah. If you were great on Letterman, and obviously, he loved you because he brought you back. So that was your testimonial right there. Yeah. But did, did Letterman have a thing that he would do if you killed? Would uh, Like, if you weren't great, would he just, like, from his desk, he's like, oh, there he is. It's uh, Moody McCarthy. But if you were great, would – it was a terrible Letterman, so I apologize to the audience. But Not bad. Not was, bad. Was there something that, like, if you killed, was there a special handshake or something? Like, did you – you just knew it? If there was one, I I don't know it, <laughs> but he was funny. So I I got to do lucky enough to do Conan, Jimmy Kimmel, and Letterman, and people asked me to compare them, um, just like their personalities. And we would we were talking earlier about Conan, who is so friendly. Conan is so fr- very friendly guy. So I tell people uh, like Letterman, you don't mingle with. He shakes your hand and he's gone like a ghost. But I knew that going in. You, you know that going in. Then Jimmy Kimmel, I got to hang out just during a commercial break. Super cool guy. He, he um, I remember he asked me. He had to mention that the following day's show, and there was a band, and he didn't know how to pronounce it. He goes, "Do you know is that Eamon or Amon?" I go, "Well, Amon is like an Irish name. Maybe it's Amon." And Kimmo tells me, he goes, he goes, I don't know who these groups are. I just listen to 80s, uh, 80s rock on Sirius Satellite, and I don't know who these people are. But he's very approachable. And then, um, so Letterman, you don't interact with. Kimmel's nice. Conan, he can't get rid of it. That guy will follow you home. <laughs> <laughs> That's Yeah, and I, I had heard that with Letterman. It was very strict. That's why I was wondering if there was something where, you know, I guess he's he's just from that old school like like Johnny. It's like, you're here. You know, this yeah. is the big moment for you in your life. The moment is not to interact yeah. with me. The moment is to get out there and you're, yeah. you're lucky to have this stage, which I'm sure you felt completely honored. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if so you, he's a and little if he, aloof, but but you're right. He is seeding the show to you. Because sometimes if you watch um, uh, Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, a, a stand-up comic will be out and they'll cut to an angle with Fallon in the background laughing. Yeah, And it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. Kind of cool, but Letterman was the opposite. Letterman would kind of, they cut the lights on him, and uh, there's no shot of him. And I think that's cool too. He's really seeding his show to you. He he doesn't want to be looming, you know. But um, it's funny. Letterman, they tell you, they tell you at the end, just do your when you finish your set, just stand there. Letterman had a policy: no no microphones. So you're out there with uh, you know uh, the lavalier oh, look, and the boom mic. Oh, okay. Yeah, but a guy like Seinfeld or something, if uh, a, a big star, if he wants a mic, he's going to use it. But guys like at, of my uh, uh, level, no mic. So you're out there, and they tell you when you finish your thing, just face straight ahead, and let him, and he'll he'll come up next to you. But don't look for him. They say don't be like hey, like. And I think it was a little game to Letterman. Sometimes he'd show up on the performer's left, sometimes on the right. I think he'd loop around and kind of whatever. But when <laughs> I did like, Conan, oh, Dave, I had been. Cont- <laughs> <laughs> please, when please. I did Conan, I did the thing at the end of the Conan. Hey, thank you very much. And I just stayed there. And uh, Conan's coming up to me like uh, he goes, "Hey, Modi, what it would like? <laughs> I'm here, like I'm here, like I wasn't turning to yeah. look to him. I had been beaten like a dog from the Letterman people just to straight to stay straight ahead. But Conan's like, "What are you doing, buddy? Could you come on, dude, pivot? <laughs> yeah, oh, okay, P- pivot. There's that word, right? That we've all had to do. Yeah, um, yeah. and yeah, you know, yeah. Conan is." Uh, I haven't had the personal interactions with with some of the uh, the other guys, um, but through the uh, the Irish organization I was telling you uh, that I work for, um, we did an event with Conan, and to get to him, we had a uh, we this we circumnavigated the the agents and everything else to get to him through a personal friend, and uh, you know it was just amazing because it was during the writer's strike in two thousand eight, and. Okay. He he wouldn't even sign. We're like, can you do it like an appearance agreement? He goes, I'm not 
signing or writing anything. He's like, trust me, I'll be there. And not only was he there, but he was early. You know, he took pictures with everybody. And he was so dedicated to the writers because obviously he was one himself before he became the front of the house talent. And I got to introduce him, which was a total highlight of my life. And I felt like I was killing, right? The room, the room of all my uh, semi-inebriated friends are laughing at all my, my stuff. And I'm like, oh, yeah. I look over and I see Conan. He's on the wall. He's like leaning. You know, he's sort of like backstage and he's like, just doing one of these. And I was yeah. like, oh my God, what did I do? How did I offend him? And I was like, gotta just stay, stay the course, stay the course, keep, keep doing your thing. And I finish up and then I introduce him and he comes up and he is like, just, psh, it was like the lights went yeah. on. He's like, Hey, yeah. yeah. And he was on fire and not a note in front of him and did like 25 minutes on his Irish heritage. And you know, no longer was I killing. That was done. That was done. Because Conan, <laughs> and it was like, it was like I seated the sh I seated my show to Conan now. But he was just he he just absolutely killed it. And then he stayed. You know, no, normally people are like, "Thanks for the award, exit stage right." I'm gone. He stayed and hung out, wow. took pictures with everybody. And my buddy goes up to him probably after six beers, and he's like, "Hey." You know, my friend introduced you and was really funny. And like, you didn't even laugh. He goes, I'm sorry. I didn't hear a word he said. No offense to to Pat. Um, he knew my name. That was enough for me. But he's like, uh, you know, no, no offense to him. Uh, I just, you know, I was just getting my thoughts together. And like, what a pro, like to be able to just one, drown that out and just yeah. get so focused in there. You know, two, that he was so dedicated to the writers that he just didn't write anything beforehand. And it was all just improv because he's the king yeah. of it. Yeah. You know, and three, hey, Conan, man, you know, screw you for not listening to my jokes. But no, I'm kidding. But it's like <laughs> it was it was just it was unbelievable. Um, and yeah. at the end of the night, I was like, hey, you know, we're having an after party. He goes, yeah, OK, uh, now I'm going to go. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> I was like trying to get him to the after party. He's like. Thanks, but uh, you know his wife. His wife was there the whole time too, and father and the the friend who you know who remained nameless who who got us uh, involved uh, was there the whole night. But I mean, what a guy! Yeah, um, yeah, he's great dude. He met when I when I did his show. Um, I had like an anecdote to share with him off off the air. My his brother went to college with three of my siblings, a, a, a Catholic college in. Um, in Massachusetts, called the Holy Cross, because it was Worcester, Mass. Was but his, my what? sister, my sister dated his his brother's roommate. So I told him that we, we I finished the set and I go, hey, I go, hey, uh, uh, one of my sisters dated your brother, uh, his roommate, whatever. And he goes, uh, oh, like uh, Kevin or Brian. He he knew his brother's roommate's name. His brother yeah. had had two different roommates. <laughs> I put that. I think that's very impressive. That he's he's from a tight family and just like, you know, like uh, to know his brother's college roommates and they He had first and last names. I was like, uh, the uh, the second one. <laughs> I wasn't ready for that level of uh, the follow up question, but he is a great dude. Really cool dude. Really and then cool just uh, fast forwarding through the all those great uh, shows that you've been on, and uh, we we touched on last comic standing and the the writing. But when people know that you're on that show, is the first question they ask you, they're like, what was Amy Schumer really like? Oh, you know what? Well, I knew, I think I was on the year before Amy. I know Amy Schumer as an open micer. I know her. Yeah. Um, oh. yeah. So I remember, I haven't bumped into her in a couple of years, but um, she was cool. She was always really cool. I, I think early on, I was one of the few people, I, heard, I go, Schumer, are you related to the senator? And that is, her father is um, the New York senator. They're cousins. Yeah, but um, yeah. we did this show at Caroline's Comedy Club, which is one of the uh, New York's premier rooms. And they used to have this contest, March Comedy Madness. They still have it. This, now, this year was virtual, and it's in, uh, in the Boston area now. A, guy, a great guy named Josh Filipowski runs it. And, um, but it's 64 comics, and you, 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 the first round, you do a minute each. And then if you advance, you do you know to 32 comics, you do two minutes each. It's a cool format. And like she, it. me and her were in it, and she, she lost in the first round, uh, which I still rag her about round, if I bump into her. Round. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think I lost in the first round too. 
One year. One year I made the final four. But the other, it's very humbling just to go up and just get sat down immediately. But we both got like eliminated early on. And she was really cocky going in. And I still give her a little, uh, a little heat about that when I see her. Yeah, well, I bet it's because John from accounting, it was a bringer show. And John brought there is the some of that. Department. There is some of that in the, the crowd. Hilarious guys in accounts receivable, and you know, and he just <laughs> he did some great AR stuff, and they just yeah, he, he killed, he killed. Them. And then like the following year, Amy Schumer did make a, a, a long run on that show, and I remember one, I remember watching it and thinking um, it was one, it was a shot of her, and they cut to commercial, and she just like flared. I can't do it, but she flared her nostrils, and it was funny. I was like. Like she's she's really good on camera. Her her, her nostrils can make you laugh. Like she's yeah. a really good actor. She's a very very good performer. Great stage presence, but I'm sure getting eliminated yeah. from that March Madness tournament uh, <laughs> way back in the day is still stuck in her craw, right? You know. Well, that's what drives you. That's like Where you know Michael Jordan. Wrong? Michael Jordan got cut in tenth grade from the varsity, and so that's that's what fuels her. You know. Yeah. Well, Bang. you know, it's that that edge, right? You got to have something, yeah. right? We were talking about that earlier. Yeah. That like. You know what to do. You know how to get out there and tell jokes and make the place laugh. Yeah. But it's it's yeah. something about it. Maybe it's a perfectionist thing or, or what it is that you always want to be better. You always want to be, you know, you, you want to kill it every time you go out there. Uh, I, I don't care yeah. if it's, you know, you know, you could pick a small club in a small town. You don't care because it's part of your brand. It's part of your reputation. It's part of who you are. Yeah. And if I'm doing, yeah. you know, it could be this small, tiny organization, first year doing it. And it's like a hayride and they're doing, you know, pumpkin picking afterwards. And they're like, hey, can we sell something? And I'm like, oh, you hired me to be here. So you're going to get absolutely the best out of me. No matter sure. what. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any show I do, I like to um, I like to be in the show. I like if, it, if someone's on before me, I kind of like to watch them or have a feel for what's going yeah. on. Sometimes you're in like, um, you know, a nice show. You're in a theater. They got the green room. And if you can't hear what's going on, I'm like it's jarring just to walk through curtains like hey, hey i i'm not i don't feel like i'm a natural performer like i gotta i gotta you can't shock me like that i i i like to walk through the crowd if i can i, I just like to be in the room and just kind of get used to it again i remember my one of my favorite comics is stephen wright and i heard an interview with him and he says he he, he doesn't like to go a month without doing stand-up because he said it gets scary again you know even this guy's been doing it you know close to 40 years he's one of the yeah, well, best that, ever. That, there it is but right you, there you, that's yeah you know that it, should be on a motivational yeah. poster in the uh you know at the comedy cellar in the green room if there is a green yeah. room at the comedy cellar i don't know if there is they got a table um, they're famous for their they, upstairs it's a, table yeah, it's, it's table. a painted it's a table they painted green they're like that's where you're gonna <laughs> hang out before you go on the stage here yeah, charlie go for it um <laughs> But I, I feel that same way too. Like they're like, oh, we have a green room for you if you want, or you know. And I'm like, uh, I'm like, I, I want to be part of the show. I want to be. I'll hang out backstage or something. Because sometimes there's something that the person before you says yes. that you can riff on. Or yep. in my yep. case, it's like, did you hear what he just said or what she just said? That is why yeah. we're here tonight to raise money. I could be serious about yeah. it or I could be funny about it. Either way. Yeah. Um, yeah yeah but it's like yeah you want to get the energy you want to get the mood um yeah. you know with the with the irish organization that uh i was, was mentioning before the we did a screening with ed burns for um his movie the fitzgerald's family christmas which i if you saw it it was probably like christmas in the mccarthy house i imagine with like <laughs> six or seven six or seven kids and he showed up like you know he's seen the movie a zillion times already at this point right um and he showed up about with like a half hour left in the movie. And he, you know, and I was like, oh, hey, Ed, good to see. And he's like, he's like, yeah, I like to come at this point to uh, to see the audience reactions and see how they're feeling, see how it's going, because we're about an hour and 20 minutes in, you know, and he's just enjoying the uh, he's he got he has to feel like he has to see what's going on. And he's like, this yeah. is the moment is like they're invested yeah. in the movie now at this point. And we're about yeah. to see, you know, the, the the lead character's arc hit that point where we're just where we're we're gonna really wrap up this story. And he's there to like get reactions and see if like you know, he knows he put out a good product. It's funny, it's entertaining, but it's like he still has to see how people are enjoying this thing. And, and speaking of those big families, you are the sixth of seven in uh, yeah. in your family, and yeah. I'm the fourth of four. So, you know, I'm, I'm, we're almost there. 
we're, we're, yeah. we're not as yeah, big yeah, yeah. as the McCarthy's, but it was still kind of crazy in my house growing up. And I will guarantee that you are funnier than the oldest person in your family and probably the second oldest as well. And, you know, I grew up, as I said, in a house with three older sisters. So the gift of gab had to come out of me to get any attention around the place. Did you use that? Did you use your voice and, and use humor uh, to get your way when you were a kid or at least to be recognized? Like, I'm here too. Probably. There probably is some of that. I think it, I think also so many people were talking that I think I just became a listener. So my, yeah. like, my like natural <laughs> disposition is I'm not a chatty. I'm a good sidekick. I, I did a little morning radio and I was like um, the third or fourth wheel. And that's my natural thing. Just being everyone was older. I'm not used to carrying the conversation growing up. It was just someone that there was enough chatting. And if I thought of something funny, I'd throw it in. So that's kind of what I am. I kind of like uh, I'll bump up the script a little bit. I'll, I'll sweeten the script, but I'm I'm not writing the script pretty much. I think that became uh, my thing. It's funny. My wife's an only child. Just like a week ago, someone said to me, I, I did a show and the woman said, um, she goes, my husband's an only child. She goes, it's all about that. I go, yeah, they're, they're, they're like, they're demand. They're like bullies. They're like, they, they, they want everything their way. And she goes, yeah, she goes, we're a good fit because she, she goes, I'm one of 10. So it was never about me. And then I married this guy and it's still not about me. It's all about him. <laughs> yeah. So it's like a natural, Perfect I think partnership. there's something Just to that. Yeah. Yeah. So as you can see behind me, besides the, the two hombres, um, we also have festival past stories and we are all about festivals. Yeah. I want to touch on the comedy festivals and you, you've done a little bit of it. Do you, did you enjoy the comedy? What, what festival did you do? And you know, what was that experience like? I'm trying what to think the one I did, the one I did was um, it's in Johnny Carson's hometown in Nebraska. It's called the great American comedy festival. And it was run by the guy who booked the Letterman show for years and years. And uh, it was fun. I think they bring like 20 comics out. You know, now that I think of it, I've done two, two festivals. I did another one in Michigan, um, the Gilda Fest, named after Gilda Radner. Oh, okay. And it's a, uh, it's a fundraiser for cancer as well. Um, and they're fun. I hey, like them Gilda's because there's a lot of comics York, around. Organization. Yes, yes. And, um, but the big festival in my industry is the Montreal Comedy Festival. And I've never done that. They do have a new faces category. And I'm hoping to be the oldest new face ever. I give myself 20 years, 20 years to crack that. But the festivals are fun because there's a lot of comics around and uh, you, you'll, you'll meet some people you don't get to cross paths with because stand-up comedy is a little um, regional. You know, there's people on the West Coast I never get to see. And there's people uh, down South. You know, I'm kind of in a little Northeast, little, uh, it's a little parochial. But they're they're fun because these days now I'm doing kind of corporate shows. Probably most of my shows are um, kind of for uh, private shows or something like that. And a lot of times I'm the only comedian, so I don't get to inter I don't get to interact with uh, I don't get to work with a lot of my buddies or meet new buddies as much as I'd like to. So the festivals um, that I've done are great. I'd like to do more of them. But now I'm old. I'm too old. I'm telling you, Pat. I'm I'm too old. They they're looking for the next new thing. Yeah, well, look, 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 the festivals, you don't have to, like, put a glow stick uh, around your neck and, <laughs> you know, and, and dance. It's not that kind of festival like this. Like, I went to a food and wine festival. Like, I, you know, a lot of the we've we've talked about electronic dance music here on the podcast, um, yeah. you know, and, you know, my learning curve for that, you know, and I'm asking these questions like I know what I'm talking about. And I'm, I'm like, uh, so DJ uh, Funny Face is, I mean, that's <laughs> he, right. Yeah. You know, that's that's the big uh, name now right and they're like yeah yeah you know i'm like oh yeah i, I love that song uh siri what did he you know it's like i'm learning yeah. all this stuff but like you know i never festivals i'm going to food and yeah. wine i'm going to comedy i'm going to film festivals <laughs> that kind yeah. of thing yeah there's so much content out there now that i know i'm missing some stuff i would love and now i so my first love is music i just love music but i'm kind of stuck in the 1980s i'm stuck with like like the pretenders are my favorite band that stuff that's right in my wheelhouse and so i was like jimmy kimmel got along so well that's right man yeah exactly yeah and um there's music now i remember riding the subway a couple of years ago and there was a uh there was an ad for some guy he sold out yankee stadium twice and he played not only did i not know of him I didn't know the genre. It was like some type of uh, uh, Latin Latin American music that 
not salsa. It was some. It was like bachata. I don't even know this. What was it? Was it bachata? Merengue Maybe yeah. Or bachata? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm so out of touch. Not only did I not know this performer, I don't even know the umbrella of music this guy's playing. Like, I was so disappointed in myself. Like, I'm like, I'm culturally illiterate. Like, if somebody's selling out Yankee Stadium twice, I should know who that is. Like, I, I, yeah, his I'm name like, is not there. I got to. No, exactly, exactly. I was like, man, I, I never thought I'd fall so far behind musically, but <laughs> here we are, here we are. So yeah, and here we are. So where are we going? You're doing the corporate events, and this seems to be yeah. going pretty well for you, Johnson Johnson Pfizer. You, yeah. You're up next, Moderna. You're up next. That's I'm coming um, for him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, folks, those aren't the Moderna's. They're that probably he's gonna. Saying. They're gonna. They're gonna get a name. They'll get a name. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Moderna. <laughs> John, Johnson and Johnson might hire me as a scientist at this point. I don't know. <laughs> was Was that the backup plan? If, if comedy didn't work out, it was a scientist. You know, you, the older I get, I do like. You know what I think I'd like. Um, it's too late to start now. Here's the thing: I've been doing stand-up comedy for 29 years. I just learned there's no pension. So it seems like I'm going to keep doing this. I just learned yeah. that. But I was thinking of jobs like for my, I don't like, I like when something works or it doesn't. I think I'd like to be an electrician because you do something, you flick a switch, it worked or it didn't. It's it's binary. And you don't. I don't like this gray area like, uh, hey, we kind of fixed your roof. I think you might, we got to check on it in a year. There's, there's supposed to be a thing there. Like, I just yeah. like things. I do like to fix things. And I like it to work or not. So I think I could be, uh, but I do like science. The older, I paid no attention in high school, but the older I get, like, yeah, I kind of like the science. I kind of like, I like that stuff. And you mentioned you're an old dad. So I'm sure your, your kids have now got you back into learning all this stuff again or, or learning new science. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And they're, they're into some movies and stuff. Like <laughs> and I try to get them into the, old, like, they're, they're very musical, which has made, makes me laugh. In fact, it, uh, I had the police on the other night. I'm playing the police. Like uh, yeah. uh, Zendata Mundala or whatever, one of those. Oh, we said at the oh. same time, you owe me one of those yeah. Cokes that you got at the bar. See, that's an 80s joke right there. An 80s move. <laughs> and they start, they start like suddenly kind of dancing and just like out of the conversation. I go, hey, I got bad news for you guys. They're five and six years old. I go, you guys like daddy's music. You, you, you don't want to admit it, but this is some good stuff. And they do. They have good taste. They kind of like Marvin Gaye. I'm kind of proud of that. Like they, they like some good, and then they like some junk I can't tolerate. Yeah, but with the police, I, I can imagine like a young kid would like to do 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 da 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 da. Yeah, just yeah, 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 yeah. First words that come out of their mouth, pretty much. Right? <laughs> exactly. That's a good point. That's a good point. But I, I once in a while, so they watch. I go, we're gonna watch an old movie. We're gonna get you a classic. We're digging around, and I'd never seen it. Um, uh, Pinocchio. Let's watch Pinocchio, right? And I'm explaining to him, I go, all right, hey, this music, this, I go, this movie came out before daddy was born, before a lot of people were born. And my five-year-old goes, did it come out before everyone was born? <laughs> and the six-year-old <laughs> goes, before everyone, everyone was born. Oh, everyone, the six -year -old yeah, goes, yeah, because you're that old. Yeah, the six-year-old goes, it was kind of funny. She goes, no, the people had to be born to make the movie. The people who made the movie were born. <laughs> so that's the kind of... Uh, Le well, legalistic you arguments daddy, we have around yeah, those. You, you could say, well, that's why daddy wants to be an electrician because when I was born, there was no electricity and I'm fascinated by it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. But they are funny. Like any kind of stimulus in life, just getting married, having kids, buying a house, anything you do is anything that is good for your comedy just kind of throws you out of your thing. That's one thing. That's why I'm not like... I'm an old man. I like every day the same way, and that's not good for comedy. You want to get knocked out of your comfort zone, so yeah, it's well, a compromise. Right. So you're now you're you've found this new comfort zone, which was probably very uncomfortable at first doing the corporate yeah. comedy because I'm sure there's within stand up and you've got your stage. There's really no rules. It's just go out there yeah. and be funny. Um, yeah. Well, maybe these days there there are there are sort of rules, uh, unwritten rules, yeah. or but. Uh, with the corporate stuff, I'm sure they give you, they're like, avoid this, we're paying you, avoid this, avoid this, avoid this. You'd probably get a disclaimer. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, you of, never get lawyers. it in print, but you, you can feel they're nervous. You can feel they're, they're nervous, and rightly so. You know, like, it is, like, even when a, when a 
when someone does a uh, set on a late night show, you're like, wow, like that network just trusted five minutes to kind of a stranger. And uh, yeah. hopefully, you know, even though, but they're not, those aren't live shows generally. But, um, but a corporation's like, okay, we, we, got, we got 200 people here and we're going to hand a microphone to this person. So they should be nervous. But I, I always tell them, it's just like, hey, if, if whatever you saw in, in, in the video from me, it's going to be along those same lines. Um, I go, I, I go, I'm not going to try to be the Lenny Bruce <laughs> of, of, uh, of awards banquets. You know what I mean? Don't, I'm not going to push my luck. But I'll tell the crowd, I go, I don't do any political jokes. You don't have to worry about that. I go, I don't do them anymore. I go, when you start comedy, everyone tells you don't do political jokes because only 50% of your audience is going to like your joke. I yeah. go, but then you do comedy for like a year or two, and you're like, hey, you know, 50%. <laughs> be pretty good. And then that gets a laugh. And then, but then I, I, do, yeah, I don't do it. anything partisan. Yeah. I did have a joke I was very happy with, and I, I don't do it anymore. Another Wanda Sykes had the same joke. It was just parallel, parallel writing. I mean, she never saw me do it. I never saw her do it. And um, but it was a joke I liked because it kind of walked the line about what you can say. And it was under our previous administration. And I go, they, I go. They always talk about how the president ages rapidly in office. I go. I feel like this guy is doing that to us. <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of nonpartisan. It, it was, it was a kind of joke I could do. They could kind of hint at my thoughts without crossing the line. But um, someone much funnier than me did it in a much, uh, did it in a, a Netflix special, so, sure. All right, so what's next for Matthew McCarthy and for Moody McCarthy? What's next for both of you, your personality? Pat, you know, well, the stand-up is coming back, and I actually like the virtual shows. The, the convenience of them is unbeatable. I remember doing a whole bunch of them going, man, I can't wait to get to a live show. And then I did like, a uh, weekend here, we live in New York City. I had a show in New Jersey on a Friday night, and then a show in Connecticut, and I remember just being stuck in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic yeah. going, man, I, I didn't give enough love to those Zoom shows. So the Zoom shows are kind of fun. I don't mind them. I think they're going to stick around. I think they're going to be 10% of what I do, I think. I don't know. That's for indefinitely. But uh, I'm trying to write a screenplay now. I'm tra challenging myself a little bit, trying to write a screenplay. And I'm going to submit it. There's a contest. I got a, gave myself a deadline of this um, a company that makes software for screenwriting. They have an annual contest. And I'm going to submit it. And I think, it's, I think it's pretty good. It could be better, but I think the premise of it is good. And that's what I'm going to challenge myself to do. It's got a musical. It's set in a musical environment. Yes, it's and it's animated. Good. Kind of a kid's, kind of kid's movie, but, but it could be for anybody. Oh, my ring light just went out. See that? There we go. I have learned during the quarantine, I'm a human ring light, everybody. I, like, <laughs> Makes you look I, so much I glow so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you say that Moody McCarthy, he doesn't age. I'm doing okay. I'm 54, so I'm, wow. I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. We play a game when we go to the playgrounds here in New York. We're like, is that a father or a grandfather? Because you get a lot of old parents <laughs> in New York City. And I, I still think I'm passing as a father. Yeah, I nice. Think. Yeah, you gotta you gotta stay active, stay in shape, and uh, yeah, you'll do it. So yeah. it's this you're you're doing the screenwriting, you're doing all this stuff. How can we find out more about you? Are you on the Instagram? Are you on Twitter? All these kind of places. I'm on I'm on all of them, and that's ah. my wife's livelihood. My wife does digital marketing for a company, so she nudges me to do all these things. I'm on them, but I am mostly inactive. I tell people. I have, on Twitter, the only one that pays attention to anything I tweet is my wife. So I just tweet, I'm going to Costco. What do you need? It's all at Moody McCarthy. And then Instagram is, um, it's all Moody McCarthy. One of the, one of the perks of having a goofy nickname. Yeah, um, you, you, on Instagram, I did shoot some short videos. Matthew McCarthy's here, but uh, only I know one it. Moody McCarthy. I know two of them. Yeah. <laughs> I know a couple of them. And, um, Instagram, I did. I haven't done one in a while, but I did some one-minute videos with my kids that were um, kind of entertaining. Has a great theme song, so my my kids have a little ten-episode uh, show called the the Late Day Show with Ruby and Lo. Those are their names. So it's not the late night show; it's the late day because your kids check out the theme song. I'm very proud of the theme song. It's us really did playing. You, so you you dug back in your music background, yeah, 
yep. to make this happen. Yeah, yeah. I brought all – my whole life has prepared me for this, Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, yeah. you can follow his kids who will be on the next episode of Festival Pass Stories. <laughs> and you can follow Moody McCarthy on his stand up. And he's probably coming to a corporation near you, maybe for a holiday party coming up. That's what and I we tell people. We'll see you yeah. on the next yeah. episode of Festival Pass Stories. Moody McCarthy, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being here. Great chatting with you, Pat. Thanks for having me. Thank you kindly. This is Festival Pass Stories, a podcast series is told by the people who create and make festivals come to life. You will go behind the stage, kitchen, or studio door to hear the stories of passion and inspiration that started some of the world's most beloved festivals. Hear the startup stories and how an idea went from what if to what's next. What's next?